Good evening. My name is Karen Offield. I am the president of the Roaring Fork Valley Horse Council. We're here tonight for the third vet event put on by our horse council. Our speaker is Dr. Chuck Maker. He's a local vet in the Roaring Fork Valley. And we're going to be talking about equine Cushing disease and the associated laminitis that comes along with insulin resistance. Now, I hope you guys will uh, be able to stay for the whole uh, lecture. It's, it'll be about an hour and a half, maybe a little shorter. And uh, we're going to record it so that um, you can see it um, again and again. Um, it's wonderful slideshows and everything else. So I'm going to pause this recording and we'll start when Chuck joins us. Thank you for joining us. Recording. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time out of your schedule in the busy uh, two hours after work when you'd rather be working outside to learn a little bit more about your horse. Um, thanks for the horse council for putting these on um, kind of in the spirit of community service, the idea to educate and empower people about typical uh, healthcare issues that involve their horse um, to try and decipher the puzzle of horse health. Uh, one step further tonight, we're going to talk about um, two rather common uh, metabolic and endocrine diseases and a dreaded disease that is often associated with them called laminitis. Um, the uh, puzzle, as I say tonight, will, it's certainly more than an eight piece puzzle, um, but we've condensed it here and we're gonna pick off three of the puzzle pieces. We're gonna talk a little bit about nutrition as there's an interplay in these diseases with uh, certain nutritional uh, triggers as well as their, the pathology which incites these diseases and elicits the laminitic or founder response as it's known in the lay, lay press. Our previous uh, demo, uh, discussions, I think they're online somewhere. Uh, Karen would be your point person for that, would be we've done a first aid um, for the trail and barn. And uh, most recently we did a colic and osteoarthritis presentation Tonight, as I said, we're going to talk about equine Cushing's disease. Um, it is commonly in the medical community referred to as pars intermedia pituitary dysfunction, but we're just going to we're going to keep it simple. We're going to use the KISS principle and equine metabolic syndrome, which is really uh, more accurately termed uh, peripheral insulin dysfunction. Once again, we're going to just say IR insulin resistance. And we're going to discuss a little bit how nutrition, a little bit differently in each of these diseases, um, worsens or tempers uh, your horse's response. And then we're going to talk about how both these diseases uh, initiate and can initiate laminitis. So with that, we'll dive into Cushing's disease first. And I always use the analogy of like Parkinson's disease, where Parkinson's is kind of a neurologic degenerative disease in humans. And, and Cushing's disease is really centered around a degenerative process that, occur, that occurs on the base of the pituitary gland, uh, which is at the base of the brain, this little area enlarged here in the picture, where the pituitary gland, the middle part of the pituitary gland in particular, which is responsible, it's like the pituitary gland is like the, the motherboard of the computer. It directs lots of hormonal and endocrine functions uh, sex hormones, thyroid hormones, uh, cortisol, et cetera, to do their jobs in the body in an orchestrated fashion. And in the pituitary patient, uh, in the Cushing's patient, the control of the pituitary gland is lost by the base of the brain. Henceforth, you've kind of got a computer that's doing whatever it wants to do. And in pituitary, we particularly see this disease uh, cause this long hair coat, um, horses drink more water, they pee more often. You know, as the age of horses go with this disease, the older they get, the more symptoms they get of the syndrome. And in several studies, uh, we've seen, you see that uh, between somewhere between 15 and 40% of horses get this by the time they're in their 20s. We start to see some horses develop it um, diagnosed on lab tests when we start testing for it when they're in their late teens. So I think a lot of times these studies are underrepresent the population because 
they're testing this group of horses that have long hair already, where we know now that horses start to develop this loss of control of their pituitary gland years be before they develop the long hair coat that people have always associated with Cushing's disease. So there's really no other risk factor. Geldings, mares, stallions are all affected equally. And the only risk factor, as we may or may not uh, test for, is that, you know, is increasing age. As you get older, you're more likely to get it. Um, so uh, there's some interplay between these two diseases. We see some horses that have Cushing's disease also show some symptoms or comorbidity, a word that I didn't use near as often before COVID, but now <laughs> comorbidity is like, well, I've got asthma, I'm comorbid. So, okay. Um, but we know that there's an interplay in, you know, one plus one equals two. But in this case, um, many times when you have both Cushing's disease and metabolic syndrome, uh, you have even more likelihoods. So one plus one in this case is three, uh, more likely to have the unwanted side effects of laminitis and other um, general health issues involved with them independently. Um, we don't know why that is, whether there is um, a root cause of each that uh, is separate or whether there are some causation factors that actually have overlap that has yet to be discovered. So here's a picture uh, last year of a horse that, you know, classically, if, if you walk up on this horse, he has Cushing's disease. There is no other disease known in the horse that gives them a hair coat like that. That hair coat's actually due to one of the hormones that's produced in the middle pituitary gland um, that stimulates hair growth. And like I said, this disease is one where the pituitary gland, the, the brain loses control of those hormonal functions in the middle pituitary gland and hair growth being one of them, a uh, disproportionate number of the hair follicles are in antigen rather than telogen. Antigen is hair growth, telogen is hair loss. So that explains why these horses have these shed, you know, they don't shed. Um, maybe a test in the spring would be just to take your jacket and rub it on your horse. And if it's coated with horse hair, maybe that's a good indicator that your horse doesn't have Cushing's disease because these horses, you can pull on that hair in the middle of July and it will not come out. Um, okay. Many times these horses are polyuric and polydipsic. Uh, by that, I mean they produce more urine and drink more. Um, we think of, you know, some diseases like uh, diabetes in, in humans is causing that, but this is really more of an indicator of, of some of the other uh, collateral hormonal functions that are done by the pituitary gland that adversely are affected and cause water loss uh, involving antidiuretic hormone. Uh, kind of uh, similar to like if you drink caffeine, there's an additional urination that has to occur as a result of that. So can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so with Cushing's and the the huge um, in the creation of all this hair, then does it not? You can't pull it out. You said in the summer, is is it a shedding kind of a situation? No. Nope. I mean, no. Nope. Just th that hair is in constant growth, and yep. you know, normally there's an abnormal or a normal circadian rhythm between antigen and telogen with a season in the okay. pine and in the brain. And these horses are just kind of stuck in drive and they never put it in park and go in reverse. So it's they always there. Okay. I, I would say in the beginning, sometimes the horses are just slow to shed out. Like, hey, my horse finally shed out in August. Okay. Um, but what eventually happens is you're body clipping your horse because they won't shed and they develop all sorts of secondary skin infections from the okay. Because of the covering. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank yep. you. And then classically with cortisol, you know, I always think of it, um, cortisol is, is, you know, you watch a human pharmaceutical commercial and cortisol is bad. It makes you put weight where you don't want it. It makes you lose muscle mass where you wished you had it. Um, and we see a lot of times in these older horses, many times they still have a slick hair coat, but these horses are in adequate exercise to maintain a top line. And yet they are in this state of apogee or muscle, muscle loss. And yet they're getting larger in their abdominal contour. So we see this go hand in hand with this character, this word we use to characterize this is adiposity. Horses put weight where they don't ordinarily have it in some pretty 
defined areas and they lose lean muscle mass where they typically would have it. Um, and this horse on the left here has got the cresty neck. He's got the fat pad behind the shoulder. He's got the fat pad in front of the shoulder. He's got fat pods all over his croup. And the one that's really characteristic of it is that the tail head and yet you know, his top line is not robust and he's being ridden four days a week in the summer. And, you know, this is as fit as they can get him uh, with calorie restriction and exercise. So um, both these situations, I, I put this picture on the right to indicate that not every cushionoid horse is gonna have long hair. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly recount many cases of situations where I've had a horse that's got a relatively athletic lifestyle that's lost the top line muscle mass. And then we get called out because he's having a laminitis episode. You know, they put him out on green grass, tried to do everything right in the spring and he found her. So um, there is definitely a complexity to these two diseases, which is why we picked them uh, this for this evening's discussion. So um, sidebar, other things, you know, we see some older horses. It's like, I'd like to get one more filly out of my mare. You know, these mares are sometimes, like I say, affected kind of before we diagnose it with a long hair coat. They're often infertile or less fertile. Um, we look in their mouths and their teeth are there, you know, they have the teeth of an 18 year old, but they have the periodontal disease of a 26 year old. Um, we know that this cortisol levels that circulate in the, in the bloodstream suppress their immune system. And the GI tract, it represents you know, one of the largest aspects of your, of your immune system. So we see horses really advance in their uh, dental issues and dental decay uh, when they have Cushing's or metabolic syndrome. We also see these horses when they run through barbed wire fences their wounds heal much slower than their younger compart uh, younger horses. Um, and even up in Missouri Heights, where we had a horse uh, last summer, um, dry, arid Missouri Heights, this horse was profoundly cushionoid and had 3,000 parasites eggs per gram of poop. So oh immunosuppression really sets them up for all sorts of infections, opportunistic infections. Um, you know, any combination of all these is obviously always the case. You, a horse doesn't have to read the, the rule book, as we say. Um, people always ask, well, I'm going to go ahead and put my horse on this medication. I'm going to cure them of it. And, um, well, you can't really cure them of that. This disease is centered around dopamine and serotonin and a loss of the ability for horse's brain or hypothalamus to control the pituitary gland. Once that degenerative uh, pathology sets up, you can't fix it. You can only manage it. And with that, it's uh, like any and many endocrine diseases, they get put on a medication and slowly over time, they progressively lose more and more of that control of the pituitary gland. So their dose is adjusted annually, sometimes every six months. But it requires annual blood work to determine if the horse is requiring more of a drug and that drug is, is pergolide in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to just recapture. Pergolide works by making the dopamine receptors in the brain more sensitive. So it's kind of like a, a synergistic effect. We're trying to say, okay, you know, we know some of these receptors don't work anymore, but the ones that work, we want them to work better um, so we put them on this pergolide drug and it's continued for life. Um, if your horse had a positive Cushing's test once in its life, it still has Cushing's. Um, there's a whole host of tests that you can do it. Uh, we won't get into that tonight because we could spend three hours on it. Um, but the test, the, the most accurate test is to do, do a dynamic test called the TRH stim test where we look at the horse's blood over a 10 minute period with two samples. And we determine if and when your horse, depending on the time of the year, uh, has um, cortisol, precursor cortisol levels above the normal range. Um, that said, we know that you know the body does various things on a daily basis with circadian rhythm. And we know also there are things that cortisol uh, get measured and change seasonally. And so depending on what time of the year your horse is tested, 
in normal ranges, we do uh, very well now understand those normal ranges and seasonal variations. So we'll look at those normal ranges relative to the time of year and determine if your horse has Cushing's disease. Um, it used to be people said, oh, you can't test them, it's fall. Well, no, you can test them in the fall. You just have to realize that the normal range is elevated in the fall. Um, one reason too, I should say, I should back up, I should say this before the first slide. I put a little bit more text on these slides because these issues are rather complex and I meant for it for the horse council to have as a resource later so people wouldn't have to scribble these things down. So um, if that helps, I'm always like a note taker. I'm always trying to write everything that people say. And if it's already written, I figure that's people can just kind of digest as we discuss it. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the, the, the other treatment modalities beyond just pergolide are managing the horse's uh, symptoms, right? We talked about infections. We talked about this, the hair coat. We talked about parasites, the additional dental care issues that are um, omnipresent. So we're always body clipping these horses because if you don't, they just will never be happy in the summer. Um, managing laminitis, I would say trying to be proactive about laminitis and working with your farrier um, to really identify stress factors and changes in the hoof capsule that suggest if there's different methods that need to be used proactively that they're instituted early. Um, really trying to prevent any sort of gastrointestinal colic, parasite, um, we mentioned that. And I will tell you that it is, you know, we, we looked at pictures earlier, we always think of the easy keeper as the insulin resistant horse. Some of these cushionoid horses, they, you know, they have fat in certain areas, but they've completely muscle wasted. So people don't identify them as special needs horses that have different nutritional needs. So you can certainly have to supplement a cushionoid horse um, because they're, you know, they just waste protein, they waste muscle off their bodies. So it's, it's unfair and, and unjust to put them all in the same category where they just, they need to be calorie restricted. Um, quite typically, they need a higher quality protein and a higher quality um, forage to survive and, and thrive. So with that um, brief overview of the 12 textbooks I have on Cushing's disease, <laughs> we'll move into equine metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance or peripheral insulin dysfunction. You know, anytime somebody calls it a syndrome, you know, to me, it always implies, oh, we must not understand this very well. Or more accurately, I think it's like, well, we don't understand the whole, you know, gamut of issues of insulin resistance. Um, and it's really one of, I, I always make the analogy when we're looking at an easy keeper for a spring vaccine. I'm like, you know, this horse has the genetics uh, to be an easy keeper. And then is his environment um, supporting or negating that ability to be an easy keeper? Are we overfeeding him and under exercising him? Mm -hmm. um, because when you put the genetics and the environment or the genetic, the genotypic and the phenotypic, as we like to say in science, factors together, that's often when problems can be compounded. And you may have the genetics for a certain disease, but if your environment doesn't predispose it, your genetics may, your genetic issues may go on um, encountered. But if you provide the genetics with environment that um, predisposes issues to be, um, to occur, then it's like the trifecta. It's like, it's the whole, it's the whole gamut. And that's much the case in these insulin resistant uh, patients. It's like the type two diabetic teenager that just wants to play Game Boy and watch TV, TV and eat potato chips, no exercise. You potentiate that insulin issues that, uh, that have all the unwanted side effects. And while horses don't eat potato chips, I make that analogy to make that point is that some of these horses are profoundly overfed for their exercise programs. And, you know, seasonally, we go from a time of plenty when we have water and huge, very nutritious green grass, mountain grass pastures uh, and relatively little exercise. And it's nothing for a horse to eat two to 5% of its body weight a day on green grass pasture. And if he does that, you know, for two weeks between light trail rides, he's gonna gain a lot of weight. So 
Um, there is, in, as different to equine Cushing's disease, where that's only involved with increasing age, there are some additional breeds. I have listed them here. Certainly mares and geldings and stallions are all affected equally. But um, some uh, do appear to be at higher risk. Some ponies, uh, some mustangs, some uh, warm bloods seem to be at higher risks. And, and the thoroughbred seems to be at lesser risk. Again, this is just for insulin resistance, not for the Cushing's disease uh, discussions. So we see that and we see these, you know, the number one thing that we usually, you know, you can't miss when you look at these horses is they have this, this extra ripple on the underneath their mane. Um, you know, and it's actually this measurement here, this black line is one of the things, you know, you can put a weight tape around your horse's girth um, but I've seen many horses that are starved of calories and exercised, and they will maintain this fat pad on their neck and over their tail head till the very end. You know, it's like the first 10 pounds you, get, you, you, you gain in college or the last 10 pounds you lose when you're 50. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very similar. So what we often do is not only do we weight tape them around the girth, we'll get a piece of uh, weight tape and we'll make marks on the tape and say, okay, this is the circumference here. This is the circumference here. And there's, you know, upper, middle and lower part of the neck where when people really want to get involved in, in managing their horse's weight, we'll have them measure those four metrics to really try and say, hey, is my horse doing well? Um, because you can certainly adversely affect a horse um, that's got these genetic abnormalities by overfeeding them. And, and yet you can also environmentally uh, change their environment such that you'll take these uh, genetically challenged horses and make them less prone to laminitis um, by um, getting them at an optimal body weight. Um, I mentioned there the, the breeds again. And then this is, this is a picture up in Missouri Heights up uh, by Crystal Springs. Um, Look at the grass, right? I mean, you go there in August, it's not like that, but we go from nothing and it's like somebody turns a faucet on and it's all of a sudden, this is um, gonna be, you know, what we have at the end of May. Uh, we already had a gas colic, grass colic and a founder case la between last Friday and Sunday. So there's enough green grass out there right now that's already having a problem with some of these predisposed horses. Interestingly, that you know, normal horses, they have this ability to adapt to changes in forage in their environment. But we know, and one of the things we identify is that horses that have this genetic predisposition don't have this ability to adapt. So it's this increased sugar that they intake in the spring pasture, particularly, that's associated with this pr protracted or exaggerated insulin response that we'll discuss here in a minute that uh, potentiates the structural changes in their feet that leads to laminitis. Um, I did a just a cursory look. We have diagnosis codes in our medical uh, records keeping software. You know, something on the order of 15 to 20% of the patients we see in this valley are overweight. Um, and that presents a spectrum between the backyard horse that's really just a companion to somebody that's actively trail ridden seasonally to, you know, a, a dressage or a jumper show horse rainer that is, um, that's ridden seasonally or a little bit more intensively during certain periods of the year. So I, that to me is a pretty striking statistic, which if you combine with the increased incidence or the knowledge that some of these horses are genetically predisposed to it, that we're kind of pouring gasoline on a, on a fire and expecting, you know, no, no problems. We're going to have problems. Um, you know, again, and this is the concept I go back to uh, just a few minutes ago. We know that this digestible energy or DE, you can potentiate these things. These things can go underneath the radar, and I think they probably did when the area was one of ranch horses and so forth. These horses, you know, they worked hard, and when they got done with work every day, they put their heads down and ate hay, but now the horses are just putting their heads down eating hay and they're doing you know, 90% less work. So we know that uh, these things are being potentiated to some extent by uh, what our uh, husbandry uh, practices are. 
So I mentioned that insulin resistance. So we know that um, equine uh, metabolic syndrome is a manifestation of insulin resistance. And what does that mean? It's like, think of antibiotic resistance. You can add more and more antibiotics to a resistant organism. And at some point, you're, there's an exaggerated response. So think of what insulin is supposed to do. You're supposed to drink a glass of orange juice and then your blood sugar goes up and then your body secretes insulin, which then allows the sugar into the cells and reduces your blood sugar levels. Um, and all that is orchestrated with the pancreas and certain aspects of the brain to normalize your blood glucose to a relatively stable state. Well, in the, in the EMS patient, we know they go out and get the green grass pasture. They eat that sugary fructose-laden green grass. They have an elevated insulin but the insulin doesn't work as well. And so then the, what essentially is, is, is what I'm saying is that the, the, the negative feedback mechanism that's supposed to allow the sugar into the cell and then allow the body's insulin levels to return to normal is, is incorrect, it's wrong. So the other things that get involved with this, which I think help explain the symptoms are that, you know, sometimes these horses are just really not very energetic under saddle. We hear that a lot. It's like my horse, you know, is he lame? And I no, I think he's just metabolic. Um, we know that thrombosis and adipocyte uh, or fat cell functions are normal. This is similar to human beings. Um, you know, overweight, sedentary lifestyle predisposes you to thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, and all sorts of circulatory abnormalities, um, kidneys, eyes, you name it, in the human world. And that end capillary bed where these issues are in the horse, unfortunately, is the feet. And what I have here is a micrograph of the lamina. And I use the analogy of the lamina is kind of like if you open up your dresser drawer and if your dresser is made of real wood, the drawers kind of have a tongue and groove uh, lock between the face of the drawer and the sides of the drawer. And think of that lock or that attachment between uh, the hoof and the coffin bone inside the foot as being this interdigitated tissue where the hoof is here and the lamina from where the hoof grows is here. And this interdigitation is kind of like, you know, it's a very strong bond normally. What, what ends up happening in these horses is the structure of this lamina changes to where this bond, the surface area of this bond is not as, as um, uh, complex or doesn't have as much surface area. So the bond between the hoof and the, uh, the hoof capsule and the coffin bone changes. And I don't know, think of any time you've seen a horse that has a dished hoof capsule. That's what's happening is that the coffin bone is staying sedentary and the, and the hoof wall is growing away from, or the two are separating. We say phalangeal rotation or rotating uh, separate from one another. Um, and so that occurs as a result of this chronic insulin, elevated insulin levels and, and that's the problem when it happens is it often happens slowly as people aren't understanding that the problem is happening. The horse has always been an easy keeper. Um, and that might suggest if we look on lab tests, that he's always had an elevated or a predisposition to an elevated insulin. And henceforth, if we look at his feet clinically uh, with a farrier uh, with an x-ray, we may find that he already has some degree of capsular rotation or laminitis present. Um, so it's a very complicated interplay here between what the horse eats and what is genetically and phenotypically or environmentally involved in your horse's health. You may not obviously identify what his gene code is, but if he is one of those horses that, you know, you feed two flakes of hay in the winter, uh, morning and night, and he still stays heavy and overweight and then really blossoms even further in the spring, he's an easy keeper and he probably has those genes. Um, so I, I think it's something to, to look at um, and, and they're starting to look at it. You know, There's oftentimes a parallel between research in the animal world and that in the human world. They're looking at this inflammatory uh, cascade that we'll get into a little bit later 
as having some parallels to what's seen in humans that have insulin resistance. Um, so I'm, I, those things always fascinate me because I think I understand my health better because I read about horse health, but maybe it should be, um, maybe I should have gone to med school, I guess. Um, so again, I mentioned this hyperinsulinemia, they're, they're elevated. Again, like with Cushing's disease where we said, hey, you know, they're ver they're circadian rhythm in these, these lab values, right? Well, it's totally legitimate to test your horse when your veterinarian's there. It's just, we need to interpret the reference ranges according to whether your horse has been fed, whether it's stressed, whether it's been fasted. So completely legitimate. I wouldn't shy away from a, a well-performed uh, lab test um, as long as there's a reference to what your horse has recently eaten. Um, that said too, people always say when we go out to see the foundering horse or the lame horse, hey, can we test them today? We know that insulin is a stress hormone and we know that when you're lame or when you're hurt, stress hormones get elevated. So measuring an insulin when your horse is foundering is not the time to do it. Um, that's just a common question. I thought I would throw that out there if there was any discussion on it. Um, there's typically um, one, one every couple of months in the summer where, well, let's just test him today. I want to save the farm call. That is exactly the wrong test uh, to do when he's actually foundering or has an abscess or anything like that. Because we know that stress hormone will be already twice what it should be, at least. Um, again, with uh, human medicine, the parallel here, we had a, a donkey that was trying to founder uh, last Thursday you know, um, similar to the type two metabolic person, uh, we see that their triglycerides um, are elevated. Um, leptin is a hormone produced by fat cells. So it just fascinates me that there's so much um, kind of parallel uh, discussion between horses with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome in humans and, and so forth. So, so um, Chuck? Yeah. When, um, um, how, okay, let's just say you, you have horses that um, have indicators. Uh, so how often would you do blood tests? If you don't do them when the vet is there, what would be the schedule that a farm owner would have? I would, I would probably suggest any horse starting at 15 or 16 starts getting an annual Cushing's test. If there's some predisposing factor of adiposity or fats, fat deposition or lean muscle mass to suggest that earlier, you could certainly do it. We do occasionally pick up on a routine blood screen that a horse is flagrantly cushionoid at 13, 14. I think I've had 112. Metabolic syndrome, um, if you've got an easy keeper, that should already be on your radar uh, annually. And it oftentimes gets even a little more complicated. You know, in Cushing's disease, we'll put them on medication. It will test their blood level 90 days later and then every year that af thereafter. In the metabolic syndrome, it doesn't take them three months to accommodate to medication per se, but you can, it's, you're chasing the goal, it seems, much longer. In my mind, it's easier to control a cushionoid patient because we have a very good medication for it. Uh, percent. It works. It works. Um, and on the other hand, metabolic syndrome, we use exercise, diet, um, some um, old, equi uh, excuse me, some old human metabolic syndrome medications like metformin, uh, thyroxin. It's kind of this, you know, I said this is called a syndrome, right? So it's like, we don't know all the facets of the syndrome. So we're using all these different avenues to try and attack the problem. And we know some of these human medications aren't as well, they don't work as well in horses as they do people. Um, so I would say, you know, at least once a year, um, if your horse is getting a biannual vaccination, Part of that, in my mind, entails like, well, what was your horse's body weight trends for the last six months? So once a year blood test as a screening tool, kind of like a PSA for a man or a, a mm -hmm. mammography or some other uh, component test that you might do, you know, um, and remember EMS, you can have a horse that's genetically prone to it 
a young horse, seven or eight years old, um, it isn't, it's not outlandish at all to think that horse could have um, an appropriately uh, uh, test for EMS at that age. And does all of that help create like a baseline? And then exactly that's like by two slides from now you must have already had you must have had the uh, the pre the pre launch of this but the goal here with EMS or insulin resistance is really to target these little metrics that we measure as like okay here's a baseline and now not you know we're not chasing a number we're chasing your horse's body weight because really we're going to give your horse a crutch of medication to help them lose weight but you have to do the nutrition and the exercise programs to go along with it. Mm -hmm. Very common in this society, I think, to say, I want to pill my way through this. And that unfortunately is not, this is definitely going to be an uphill road if that's the case, because mm -hmm. we see treatment failures, which i.e. laminitis, uh, when horses are on medication and yet they're not losing weight and all of a sudden they founder. So, um, that, that's that's a perfect leading comment to a slide here I have. Um, so again, I'm gonna just, this is here for just for information um, because I thought people might wanna refer back to that I that have their vet elsewhere. Um, you know, what they may ask the a question so they get a the learned answer to what is the best test to do for this disease. And, um, I just a, a quick comment on circadian rhythm again, right? Is um, a lot of these diseases, these endocrine diseases can be problematic to diagnose. Sometimes, you know, if you think about what circadian rhythm means, it means, you know, your body temperature, your blood glucose are going up and down throughout the day. And if I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough to measure your horse's blood just at the wrong time, he may be overweight, adipotic, et cetera, but he comes up with a normal lab result, you may say, oh, well, then he can't have equine metabolic syndrome. But think of what I mentioned earlier is that equine metabolic syndrome is, is really aptly termed equine insulin peripheral dysfunction. And it, it entails a, a degree of um, performance, if you will. It's not the level that's the problem. It's that your horse's insulin response is exaggerated or abnormal. And that's, that involves a dynamic test where we give your horse a certain amount of sugar and we measure their sugar uh, afterward and so forth. So we're trying to measure how well the insulin works, not just what the insulin level is. Um, I see a lot of these comments on dietary nutrition and we could spend, and I have, if that's it interested the group for next time, uh, just a discussion on nutrition. Um, but to get to your comment, Debbie, the goal is not a number, it's a baseline, but the goal is really to get your horse at a optimal body weight because so many of these can be kind of, how shall I say, um, normalized with a good exercise and nutrition program. So, so my, um, my fiance is type two diabetic mm -hmm. and he can tell when he needs sugar or when he needs protein. And it's almost an instant reaction when he gets more sugar, he feels better, or when he needs protein and gets protein. Do horses have that kind of timely response? I don't know if I can personify what they, I mean, you know, they're right, they're used to eating seasonally whatever there is in the pasture. We know. Yeah, they can graze, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they're eating kind of like a, and ensure breakfast drink all day. It has protein, it has sugar, it has fiber. Okay. Um, I don't know if we could say, if we could parallel that. Okay. But we do know that, you know, what the problem is with spring grass is these non-structural carbohydrates. It's fructose. Yeah. It's not high fructose corn syrup, but it's, you know, an analog thereof is that we know these spring stress plants uh, that first emerged this month have a higher amount, a higher percentage of starch in them. And we know that these metabolic syndrome horses should really be in a starch limited diet. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that starch can so widely vary with how a hay is put up and stored. Um, and what is good for one horse that's exercised five days a week with the right or wrong genetics is not necessarily good for the other horse 
that isn't exercise, right? So, I mean, I think you're stabbing, you're making a shot in the dark if you say that grass hay is good for all um, metabolic syndrome horses, because we know some alfalfa hay is much less in starch than certain mountain grass hays. Um, that said, though, you have to take the whole picture and you've got to account for the fact that, you know, ultimately it's calories, right? And it's exercise. How many calories does your horse need in a day? So that stab in the dark, I try and diffuse that by, you know, shedding light on it and, and ensuring that clients at least, you know, think about um, testing their hay so we can really quantify. I mean, it, you know, I, some people say I'm a sous chef for my horse because I have to figure out exactly what they need to eat. And there is some truth to that because on the one hand, you're limiting their calories and you're really defining and designing a diet for them. And on the other hand, you know, taking care of calories in the diet is only part of it. There's a lot of micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, that have to be provided in a balanced fashion. And, and unfortunately, many times people think it's just calorie restriction. And um, that, isn't, that isn't the case. Um, and that we do see problems uh, that arise because you know, a horse needs more than 1% of its body weight a day because those diets tend to be deficient in certain very important nutrients, protein, vitamins, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I throw on here, and Debbie, to your comment, you know, if the goal, let's say, is number five and your horse is number nine, and, you know, there's a couple tick marks here on this horse. These are these body score assessments that we give horses at their spring and fall wellness evaluations. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the medical record, they're just, you know, a five out of nine, a nine out of a nine, a one out of nine. You know, if it's a three or below or even a four or below, there's probably going to be some intervention that's necessary. There's a medical condition present that we need to address. Maybe it's age, but maybe it's something else. And depending on the breed and the... Um, and the discipline and so forth, you know, somewhere between a four and a half, more likely a five to a, a high six are normal. And then these sevens to nines get to be problematic, right? And so you can see where, you know, if you look at going from eight to nine, it may be only partially effective to measure the horse's body weight at the girth because he may lose his top line muscle mass if it's Cushing's disease, let's say. And you may measure his girth at the withers where I tell people to always measure it where the last main hairs are. And yet he may hold on to this really crusty obese neck and this fat pad on his tail. So many times it's more complicated than just saying, okay, my horse is a, is a seven and doc told me seven's normal. So he can't have any problems and his insulin was 38 and he can't have metabolic syndrome as a result. Well, if he's a seven and he has a, you know, a hoof capsule that is deformed and shows some of the risk factors for laminitis, I would offer that, yeah, he easily could have uh, insulin resistance and, and benefit from us being proactive in his nutrition, exercise, and proper uh, diagnosis and um, pharmacology medications. So I just, these are again for reference, but I put through the, the preceding slide with the one through nine, you know, some pretty, um, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, here's some of the words, um, and, you know, and obviously this horse and the, the classic thing is the Cushing's horse that is not shed out, has tons of hair, has got this apache, this muscle atrophy over his top line and then finally, when they body clip him or he does shed out by some means in August, all of a sudden you can see his ribs. He's got fat over his neck. He's got no muscle uh, whatsoever over his top line. And he's got this kind of large hay belly and people go, oh, it's just sway back. And then when you look at the hoof rings, you go, oh, I think there might be some problem here. I think this horse warrants a Cushing's test. Um, you know, in my mind uh, or comprehensively, it's this, this blood work kind of similar to what we do in human medicine, where you get like an annual something or other at your doctor's office. We use that now um, very commonly to, to pick off this, these diseases before their unwanted catastrophic sequela occur. Um, mm -hmm. And then I go through four, five, and six, you know, again, yeah. um, 
you know, pregnant, but nevertheless, uh, she can be adipotic. Uh, and that we do see that we see adipotic, you know, we do see these metabolic challenged horses, these mares, they do get pregnant. And then that extra weight that they gain in their late third term of pregnancy potentiates this weakened hoof capsule attachment even further. And then the last time of the, you know, in your horse's life, you want them to founder is when they're eight and a half months pregnant and you got, you know, two and a half more months to go before this foal comes and they can barely stand on their feet. Um, we see that actually, uh, it's, it's horrible to see that because you know they're gonna gain more weight and you know the stress of that uh, laminitis is gonna be a problem, so. What it, is adipotic? I didn't adipotic know. is that term I use. It's used um, now to describe this, you know, this disparity between, uh, or this characterization of, my horse seems relatively normal in some areas, but he's got large fat areas in certain areas, lost muscle mass here, but yet he's got all this fat in front of his shoulder and on his neck and over his tail head. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a medical uh, term used to describe that in a nutshell. Okay. Um, so, you know, nine here, this is, you know, this horse needs a work program, a uh, work detail. Um, you know, and if, if, we, if we just break it down into its, uh, to go back to a comment I made earlier, you can't, you can't ever uh, over work out, you know, the fork, if you will. They're, they're gonna eat, if you don't exercise them and you let them eat uncontrolled, you're gonna have a problem. And these unwanted genetic predisposing factors that are present sometimes unknowingly can become problematic and, you know, this quarter horse probably has a size ought or one feet at best. And if you make her 250 pounds overweight, um, they're gonna set up a laminitis situation. So we know, um, you know, people, right? How do you, what do they say when you're type two diabetic or you have metabolic syndrome? They say, well, you gotta exercise. It's a lifestyle disease, right? It's kind of similar in a horse. Yeah. know that insulin receptors become more sensitive with exercise. We know that you got to change your diet at the same time. Um, we know that, you know, if you take a, a fit nine-year-old horse, their insulin seems to work the same as whether they're exercised or not. But we know that there's this genetic trigger that for some reason on these horses that have these, this problem, that exercise has a, has a muted ability to enhance their um, insulin uh, sensitivity. So it, it's complicated. And that's why um, she's not on the, the panel tonight, I see, but um, I know she's involved. It's, it's, you know, to put them on medication and not exercise is wrong. And, and while I have seen some be reluctant to put them on medication, just work them through uh, a challenge weight um, it's extraordinarily difficult and takes just a tremendous amount of diligence to diet and exercise through this many times. Because by the time this is involved, many times either they're starting to have some laminitic issues and they can't be exercised fully because they're lame, uh, or it's just, it's, it's a striking a, a calorie restriction that has to be um, that has to be instilled or instituted in the horse's life and, and medication can help enhance the efficacy of that. Um, so low intensity exercise, um, we know, you know, in people, A1C, you know, test your A1C, my type two diabetic, you know, many of these same pro-inflammatory cellular markers from the liver, from the pancreas are also potentially measured in horses and exercise has been uh, shown to help improve those metrics as well. We don't measure those on a mainstream basis, but we measure the sometimes the fat cell hormone leptin that I mentioned earlier, and certainly insulin, um, because those are the ones that we have readily available to and readily uh, referenced, uh, refereed reference ranges for. So um, again, back to Debbie's leading comment, the goal is, uh, uh, you know, we start off with the baseline and we work toward a goal that involves a, a healthy weight and um, uh, typically a number in, in a normal range. Um, 
So, you know, when people ask me, uh, let's say they've got a Mustang um, or an Andalusian, um, you know, what's my horse's optimal body weight? And your horse's optimal body weight is going to be one where these metrics are not involved to potentiate laminitis. And it may involve repeat sequential testing over a period of months uh, with a rigorous diet to determine what that is. Um, I can think of many cases where horses, I can think of one in Newcastle rather recently that went from being rather obese to quite normal at 1,030 pounds on a weight tape, but he still maintained his lab values well out of the reference ranges and actually had a pretty bad laminitis uh, episode on all four feet. Um, and then we got him down to what probably everyone would have said, I'd like him to have a little more insulation on his ribs. I'd like him to be a little heavier, but it was amazing because once he hit about 930 pounds on the weight tape, his insulin levels and all of those metrics changed for the better. And he hasn't had an issue since, since last July. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I can, you know, try, if you lose 20 pounds, sometimes the value of losing that 20 pounds isn't just in your clothes fit better. It's all the things that are supposed to work better, work better. And the same as goes for horses. Um, okay. So, uh, reality and, you know, Sometimes these horses are on green grass pasture eating 3% of their body weight a day, which a horse will do if it's a palatable uh, food. Um, and, you know, sometimes we got to get down, depending on the density of calories in a, in a horse's hay, to somewhere near 1.25%. So you got to go from eating three square meals to this intermittent fasting almost, you know, we put it in a hay net, make them eat slowly. Um, it can be challenging. Um, and we know that these horses, there's usually at some point in the, con in the continuum of managing these cases where people just get frustrated and say, I've been doing this for the last three months and my horse has only lost 35 pounds on the weight tape. I can tell you that it is challenging, but in the end, success is possible. Um, but we know that these horses genetically, right, they have the genes you know, some of these Mustangs and where they've come from and European horses, right? I mean, Andalusians, they get fed straw in Europe. Um, they have some genetics that predis that allowed them to sustain themselves on, on lesser quality feed. And they get brought to the US or, or so, you know, in habitation, if you will, and they get fed 14%, you know, second cutting grass hay from Milagro Ranch, which is like, you know, a tossed green salad and, you know, with a little arugula and you know, oil and vinegar. I mean, it's, it's like comparing, you know, we're, we're, in, we're altering the expression of their genetics pretty substantially if you think of those two ends of the spectrum. Masticating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I just put it here because I can't be stressed enough that uh, just starving your horse is not what I'm discussing. It's, you know, it's properly analyzing the hay, finding out what's in it, and then telling you how many pounds to feed, but then understanding, okay, you're probably going to have to buy some supplement that's going to provide those trace uh, micro and macronutrients in appropriate levels, because otherwise your horse's health is going to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, lots of, lots of information on here. And I, again, I throw this here because usually it's somewhere in here that people say, well, I'm gonna soak the hay or I'm gonna steam the hay or, you know, the idea uh, behind that is that, you know, some of these uh, non-structural carbohydrates, things that don't provide structure in the plant, i.e. starch, i.e. fructose, um, they're soluble in water. It's one of the metrics that we get when we provide, uh, when we do a hay test. Well, if you soak the hay or better yet steam the hay, those water soluble products get, it's kind of like, you know, putting iced tea mix in a glass of water. They get dissolved in the water and you throw the water out and you're left with theoretically a hay that has got less soluble, uh, easily digestible starches and sugars in it. That's true. Where I see it fails is oftentimes is people will soak the hay and then the, 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 the horse is left to eat the soaked hay in the water. And the water is usually like a dark green, black Kool-Aid 
that contains all the sugar in it. So horses love it. I remember at a horse show when I was a teenager, we would bring Kool-Aid to get our horse to drink water uh, when they were stressed and couldn't figure out, you know, how to drink when they were at a show. You know, you put cherry flavored Kool-Aid in their water in 1983, they drank all the water that you gave them. And it was, um, so I think this is kind of like, you know, horse Kool-Aid. So don't steam your horses hay and, and let them have the water. So um, I, have a, I have a question on that, Chuck. Uh, I'm yep. glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask anyway. When my horse is out in the pasture, he doesn't have the option to do this. But whenever I have him at the trailer feeding him, he will intentionally take the hay and dunk it in his water bucket as he's eating it. So he's doing this by choice. What, what is he trying to tell me by doing that? Um, my guess would be either one, I've seen playing with water to be a stereotypical behavior. I mean, some horses just do it. Um, and then okay. the other is sometimes if it's a stemmier hay, I'll see horses do that. They'll drink more water with it. Um, you know, less saliva that they have to provide to it. I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, I've more often than not found the whole water dunking and water pooping in buckets and so forth to be kind of a stereotypical thing. I would encourage that though, because if he likes to drink water, you've got, in my mind, that's, that's a win-win. Um, okay, just don't leave the water for him to drink. Yeah, I mean, if he's, if he's a sugar, uh, if he's a insulin resistant uh, ticking time bomb, yeah, I would, I would soak his hay and then, you know, they have these big, huge colanders now where you can soak the hay, pull the colander out with the hay, pour it in the bin and dump the water. Um, if, if that's what you're managing, because uh, you have some easy key, easier keepers, that's what I would do. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, you know, it does take water a long time to do this. Steam is faster, but these hay steamers are, you know, I saw one bought last year at a barn for $3,000. Um, you know, it was like a Viking refrigerator that somebody had uh, turned into a hay steamer that you could put the whole hay bale in there, steam it, and then feed it to the four horses. Um, it was pretty elaborate. They're commercially available. It's just, they are expensive. Um, a couple notes before we dive into laminitis as a final chapter of this discussion are a couple medications we keep alluding to. You can't outpill um, genetic and environmental husbandry practices. Um, thyroid powder, you know, usually on an incremental increasing regimen until we hit the sweet spot again. You don't want to increase their metabolic rate with thyroid powder if at the same time you're just increasing or not controlling the calories they take in. Um, and very rarely do we see hyperthyroidism as a result of judicious thyroid medication. I could say I never see it from oral medication. Uh, metformin is a very inexpensive, unpalatable drug um, that's used in human metabolic syndrome or used to be. I think it's been replaced now by something, one called pioglitazone. To use the newer generation ones in, in problematic horses, we used pioglitazone actually in the horse I mentioned in Newcastle uh, favorably. Um, and it's poorly bioabsorbed. Horses' GI tracts are not human GI tracts. But we do have some efficacy with these medications in horses. We just know that in horses, um, that efficacy is partly, partially muted by their absorption and partially due to the fact that we know some horses develop some resistance to this drug in particular. So again, back to the comment of Debbie is like, we're using these things as crutches, as adjuncts to better management to, to, to make your horse healthier. I don't think they're a substitute for those other things. Now as a final, uh, five or 10 slides here, I have a bit on laminitis, which in my mind is like worthy of the next 10 of these um, discussions, you know, and, and we have everything from, you know, my horse is just a little subtly lame. He doesn't pick up the light right lead or he swaps leads up front or he's, you know, mouthy or he's, he bites me when I, you know, cinch him up to head bobbing, right? You know, a foot goes down on the ground and he shoots his head way up. I mean, everything's possible with laminitis to, oh, he's just a little sore on the corners or he doesn't like, doesn't like getting his feet picked up. 
um, characterizing the typical laminitis. Um, we used to, you know, discuss it by this famous lameness diagnostician by the name of Obel, you know, um, but it's, if, if we're being proactive about laminitis as it's interplays uh, as a result of these two diseases, uh, it can be certainly many, many times, much more commonly very subtle rather than the classic, oh, my horse has a subsolar abscess, um, that kind of degree of lameness. So this is the classic one, right? This horse wants to stand on its back feet. It will not put weight on its front feet. Um, uh, there's all sorts of things. They can range from uh, very hot, um, increased dynamic pulses in the feet to a lack of blood flow to the feet, depending on what's causing it. Um, remember I mentioned one of the things, one of the disease states that's kind of offset in this insulin conundrum is this thrombosis uh, where blood vessels clot, if you will. So we can have, depending on what's going on, you know, certain aspects, the front of the hoof be devoid of blood flow and be very cold to the touch, um, depending on the phase of the disease process they're in. Um, sometimes we're just, you know, there because the farrier comments that, boy, this horse grows a lot of toe and next to no sole. And we know that that hoof capsule change, that rotation of the hoof capsule um, causes a change in the blood flow to the soul and diminishes the soul growth and predisposes uh, the soul to discolored bruises um, that are commonly uh, seen by owners when they're picking their horse's feet out. Um, so, you know, the CD toe is that open white line. Um, we see that very commonly. It's, it's amazing how obvious that sign is. And I had a veterinary professor, Dr. Hinton, back in the early 90s that said, you have to make sure you're seeing what you're looking at. And sometimes just a, a diagram, a picture is worth a thousand words. But, you know, my horse is lame up front. I'm going to put my fingers right here and here and see if he's got increased pulses. Um, we know that increased pulse, both the character of the pulse and the quantity of the pulse per minute indicate a problem. We don't know what problem, but it certainly gets us looking as to what could the cause of the problem be. And with laminitis, the earlier the intervention, the better. Um, certainly that is the easiest spot to determine the pulse. The other one, depending on the size of your hand is that blood vessel that's coursing down each side of the leg also courses right over the sesamoids right here. So depending on the size of your hand, you can grab the horse's fetlock from behind and it feels like a little pencil underneath your, your fingers. And when it, when it is an increased pulse as a result of the early phases of laminitis, it's like you hit your thumb with a hammer and it's throbbing. Um, and, and sometimes arguably uh, to, to support owners, I mean, if your horse is equally lame in both front feet, right? I think it's more easy to determine a horse is lame when they're only lame in one foot because then it's like this asymmetry between the left and right. We see a lot of horses that are lame in both front feet that come in and, and people don't have an even an, a knowledge that the horses are lame in both front feet because, you know, they got two front feet and they're both equally lame. So they go down the road and they, they're doing the best they can, but there's some characterization of the lameness that, that causes us to look a little further as to the possibility of laminitis. Um, here's finally the picture of the, of the cross section of the foot, right? And the lamina, remember that, that histogram I showed you of the lamina, that dovetail joint between the, the attachment uh, at the hoof and the hoof wall, it's all right here. That picture is all right here. It's microscopic, tiny, tiny little, you know, uh, cellular interdigitations that hold that horse's hoof up from the attachment. So the reason why laminitis is so debilitating, right, is if, if this bone is not held against this hoof wall securely, the horse's weight wants to push that bone through the bottom of the foot, which is what can happen. And if you think about it in the less severe state, but nevertheless significant state, if that hoof rotates because this, this attachment is lost, there's a very important blood supply right here that gets compressed. And that blood supply is what um, helps stimulate soul growth. So 
You'll see the sole bruises down here on the sole. You'll see your farrier will say, this horse never grows any sole. And, you know, again, you know, he's got lots of toe. Um, we see those changes ultimately as a result of the loss of attachment uh, in the lamina and the loss of a healthy blood supply circumferentially around the foot. So Chuck? Yeah. Um, so in an x-ray, you would see that? Right, so we will see on an x-ray, right? Bones white on an x-ray, if you will, and soft tissue is any one of 256 shades of gray, but you'll see the hoof wall here and the coffin bone here, and there's a normal parallel orientation. You know, they are supposed to be parallel. There's a, what's called a high, up here high, in a low zone. And we can digitally um, measure this thickness and this thickness to say, okay, there's normal parallel orientation between the hoof wall and the dorsal hoof capsule. Rotation has not occurred yet. We may be at risk though, because um, all the factors that we've talked about with these two diseases are present. The horse has poor soles, the horse has thin soles, the horse has this adipotic body conformation, uh, forelimb lameness that's indicating inflammation in this attachment between the coffin bone and the hoof wall. All these predisposing or precursor symptoms that have not, you know, it's like the final domino. Nobody's pushed the final domino for things to go, you know, nuclear. The nuclear option has not been pushed, but all those telltale signs are present that tell us to be proactive and aggressive with respect to how we want to manage him. Excuse me. And Chuck, yeah. this yeah. is the normal hoof, right? What we're looking at in this slide. Um, well, to me, there seems to be a little uh, increase uh, thickness in the lamina. There's a, like your fingernail, there's a keratinized portion or an, a non-sensitive portion and a sensitive portion. You can trim your fingernail to a certain point and then you feel it, right? There's an innervated portion and an uninnervated portion. Um, one of the means if we are in question whether or not a horse's blood flow has been altered irrevocably would be to do a venogram. We'll put some dye in a blood vessel in the foot and radiograph that foot at a certain time thereafter determine where the blood vessels are. Kind of like going to the cath lab at Valley View. It just, it doesn't cost $10,000, it costs 300. Um, and you can look and see if the blood supply, if your horse has got a actual ongoing or a, a current uh, laminitis uh, situation. And a venogram also tells us about prognosis. If the blood supply is impinged in this area, um, you know, it can give you tremendous prognostic value. So here's one where the hoof has been removed. I have one of these in the other room where literally um, this horse was up in Missouri Heights um, and they walked it out of the stall in the morning. It had been lame for several days, laying down more than they liked. It was in the spring and they walked it out of the stall and the hoof stayed in the stall. Oh. And the horse walked out of the stall oh. and why I was there. Um, you know, Typically, the lamina that are affected most adversely are the, are the, is the blood supply is most compromised at the toe, and that the blood supply around in the back of the foot is less adversely affected. But, you know, if you think about it, um, it's simply a measure of severity. Um, we can see any, anything on the spectrum. Um, so, you know, these numbers are very... I guess if I say they're antiquated, that means I'm antiquated because these are the numbers that they taught me when I was in school. But some of these things still have value in trying to impart the severity of laminitis and the need to be very proactive in understanding the root cause of some of these. Um, you know, there, if you read the horse magazine last spring, there's all sorts of discussions about endocrin endocrinopathic laminitis. And that's what we're talking about tonight is that these two diseases set up a certain situation, a pro-inflammatory situation 
and a structural change in the feet that when the wrong nutritional figure uh, um, figures are added into that horse's lifestyle, they potentiate a laminitis episode. And it's, that's kind of what I mean about like, it has not catastrophic yet, but once your horse rotates, you know, once a foundered horse, always a foundered horse, we're gonna be managing it for the rest of that horse's life. Um, so here's just a um, simplistic uh, um, back in the nineties, um, you know, we've got a horse here, like in the picture, uh, in the in cross section, Karen, that we were talking about, where you know this is the early phase. This horse may have stone cold feet on palpation, or he may have red hot feet, depending on where he is. And that can be, it can be a difference of two to six hours whether they're in one or the other. And what's happening here is the blood supply is being compromised to this uh, lamina at the toe uh, of this horse. So if you think about it, you know, things can only survive with marginalized blood supply for so long. And then depending on the horse's disposition, whether they like to lay down or whether they don't lay down or they never lay down, it's amazing how some horses, the horses that lay down heal faster because they get off their feet. But this horse, you know, he's got this swelling, if you will, this blood flow impingement to his foot that if, not proactively managed becomes this and then this. And you can see with these three pictures how, you know, the degree of separation between the hoof capsule and the coffin bone is substantially worsening and further impinging the soul of the horse's hoof health. Chuck, uh, what are the little lines with the blue dot uh, on the interior of the cannon bone sketch? It, so the, the I, oh, I should have had one in here. The little dots are actually the, the, the coffin bone is kind of like a cup. Like on an x-ray, we see, if we look, it's easy to see the rim of the cup, but it, the inside of the coffin bone is actually cupped. And oh, that's depicting the, the kind of the, the dorsal convex shape of the horse's hoof. I mean, you may have read that, you know, the, the rhythmic movement of a horse, you know, shifting weight is actually kind of a blood return mechanism. Um, and there, there, is a, there is a lot of, of hemodynamic um, blood flow um, alterations that are built into how the horse's foot is anatomically configured. Um, and, you know, we typically, I typically will try that blue dot is um, typically going to represent where you know, the, the center I'm going to try on this foot, I'm going to try and move the break over. You see this shoe on here. This is, this is an old uh, picture, but this shoe here, you know, somebody has got the break over on this shoe right here. We know now that we are way beyond that. We try and bring the break over and the forces across that lamina as close to zero as possible. And we put them in wedged clogs made of wood or plastic in this acute phase. I don't have a whole lot um, of slides on the farrier applications of this. Um, that again is a, 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 a several, that'd be an ongoing MBA course, I think, to be honest. Um, you know, again, so again, put differently, you got a mild case, a moderate case and a severe case. Um, this horse is telling us that there's some stacked up growth rings at the toe and wider growth rings at the heel. Why are those growth rings disparate in their width? It's probably because the blood flow is altered between those two areas of the foot. And why is that? Uh, if this foot is underneath a body score nine quarter horse that weighs 1,250 pounds, it's because he's trying to founder and it best be proactively managed. And, and by that, I mean the whole gamut, nutrition, exercise, farriery, blood work, you know, uh, internal medicine and so forth. Um, just a couple of cutaways um, and some kind of closing comments on what laminitis, you know, the acute phase of laminitis is what we talked about that happened last Friday and this weekend is that horse goes out on green grass, alters its sugar intake, um, you know, 
is predisposed to it because there's a insulin dysfunction in the horse and they're foundering, you know, in days. Um, these things, these, these chronic soul bruises and abscesses and separations and unhealthy hoof walls um, and degradation at the tip of the coffin bone, we know they're all kind of in that chapter of, you know, gosh, we, why does your horse keep getting soul bruises at the toe? Or why is he getting abscesses at the toe all the time? He's getting well, you know, well cared for feet by your farrier. Um, maybe we should look and see if there's an underlying disease process here that's occurring. You know, it always has been an easy keeper, uh, carries a little extra weight on her neck. Uh, and sure enough, you find out, oh, well, yeah, okay, they're, they have this underlying condition that's predisposing these other things downstream to occur. So um, sometimes, you know, you have to step further away from the fishbowl to get the whole picture. Um, would be, I guess, the summary there. Could I, could I ask a question about that previous um, yeah. hoof, hoof photograph? Is this a, a, the separation here? Is this a treatment or is this um, an example from a horse? Uh, this horse ripped its hoof wall off. Uh, it was partially separated. Um, I had one like this uh, in basalt a few years ago where the horse had a chronic hoof wall crack. And when the horse foundered, um, his entire, you know, a third of the hoof wall cracked and fell off. There was nothing attaching it anymore. We actually did a venogram on this horse about a week earlier and identified that the blood, there was no blood flow to the hoof wall, so to the sensitive part of the hoof. So we cautioned the owner. We said, this has no prognosis there. You know, this is going to fall off. It's dead. And sure enough, it had a small little crack that had been there for years and that was the weak spot and it it fell off you know in the stall um, so uh, sometimes you don't like to be proven right um, <laughs> yeah that was a very challenging one I felt really bad because the horse the venogram we don't often we don't I shouldn't say often veterinarians vary in their opinion on how often to do venograms um, Sometimes they give us um, additional information and sometimes they corroborate what we think we already knew. Um, and sometimes, you know, things can't be done due to budget constraints. Um, and sometimes they're done to measure the efficacy or lack thereof of certain podiatry or farrier techniques involved. So laminitis and these things, very complicated and whether or not, whether or not we do these things. Sometimes just two x-rays tells me everything I need to know um, but that's certainly blood work and, and the x-rays are certainly a place to start in many of these cases. Um, I mentioned this inflammatory cascade because again, it fascinates me to discuss and learn in, in a, in a non-medical doctor type way about, you know, these, uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, um, you know, you can't help but watch TV and you get learned about a new pharmaceutical that, you know, is available to us if, if we have a certain disease, right? So it, I take that a step further and I wanted to know about that. These, this lamellar damage can start anywhere on the, on the dial, if you will. And if you look at many of the things we've talked about tonight, um, you know, a horse being overweight incites further tissue damage because there's more weight on the horse's hoof. Um, excess cortisol and insulin resistance uh, incites a pro-inflammatory state. Um, you know, we know that horses with uh, athletic trauma, you know, form follows function. Um, we can have uh, certain cases of laminitis due to uh, work on hard ground or uh, a protracted lameness on one leg and laminitis on the other leg as a result. Um, so in my mind, it's like this revolving wheel. And it's like, if that's the case, it goes back to one of the principles I've been trying to discuss. And that is you kind of have to look at this as a full 360 review of your horse's health. And um, just managing it with your farrier often is not going to be successful. And just managing it with your veterinarian is often not going to be successful. It takes a collaborative team effort 
to properly manage and diagnose all these um, independent uh, variables in these diseases. Again, uh, just a couple things about what can set off laminitis beyond just these endocrinopathic uh, diseases, uh, insulin resistance and Cushing's disease. Um, we know diarrhea caused by anything in a horse can set off a laminitic episode because there's a, a process that occurs, um, a pro-inflammatory state that occurs systemically as a result of um, changes in the horse's gut that then have their effects on these little end stage capillary beds located in the lamina. So colic, colitis, i.e. inflammation of the colon or diarrhea. We know that you know, certain really severe pneumonias, particularly shipping fever, um, these, when these bacterial toxins um, augment or stimulate this protective mechanism by the horse's platelets, that is then affected downstream and can cause some of these same laminitic changes. Um, we don't see it very often, but retained placenta in uh, mares following foaling can also do the same thing. Um, I haven't seen it since I was a kid because everybody knows not to use black walnut shavings. You know, a lot of people get shavings from local cabinet shops. Just need to be imperative that they don't use um, any black walnut shavings uh, in what you're getting. Uh, because many times they use walnut to, to make furniture with. So I mentioned it there just because repetition is the key to learning. Um, so again, other things, you know, we saw a horse, two horses get involved with a pickup truck full of 100 pound bags of feed last summer. Um, uh, one died of colic um, rather rapidly and the other one eventually foundered. We saved him, but um, you know, those um, gastrointestinal distress caused by grain overload in the gut, um, again, initiates a pro-inflammatory state whose mainstream effect, if you can get through the colic, cause, is caused at the feet. Um, we used to do, I mentioned the appropriateness of certain tests for Cushing's disease. One of them used to involve administering dexamethasone. And one of the mainstays of therapy is to do no harm and we know that, you know, there was a study back in the 70s that showed that administering steroids to these horses, whether it be for respiratory needs or for arthritic needs, um, sometimes unwantedly predisposed a laminitic episode. And until roughly the mid 90s, the mainstay of, of diagnosing these horses was to give them a shot of dexamethasone and measure what their own body's cortisol did. Um, unfortunately, a small subset of those patients developed laminitis as a result of getting the dexamethasone. So now we have a different test, a better understanding of uh, the methodology, and we don't do that anymore. Um, I can say the other causes are pretty uh, infrequent, um, but for extreme weight loading, when the horse gets an orthopedic condition like a septic joint in, a, let's say, a right front leg, and you're busy fixing the right front leg, he's non-weight bearing in the right front, he's solely bearing weight in the left front, uh, you know, three to five days later, um, you may be dealing with a, a horse that's laying down because he's tremendously foundered in the uh, weight bearing leg. When he's weight bearing fully on one leg, he can't vacillate his weight between both feet. And we know that horses need to do that shifting weight to continue to allow the blood flow up and down into their lamina. That's actually a normal process. I smell peanut sauce. Uh, that? Peanut sauce. Where are we eating tonight? <laughs> um, a couple of just horrible <laughs> pictures. This one was in Carbondale. This horse just, you know, despite all of our efforts, rotated right through the bottom of the foot. Mm -hmm. This is another horse uh, that um, a colleague at a university shared with me that you know was cross section, but you can see that you know this little nice thick sole down here, which was once was, is now all this little thin whisper is all that sits between this point of this coffin bone and the in the outside world. So um, there are heroic measures that we often try and do like tenotomy, which has its place early on in the disease process and other things. But, um, I think the, the center of this discussion has been to be one of proactiveness 
and trying to avoid these last uh, couple metrics. This kind of, if, if there's interest to discuss nutrition or potentially farrier techniques are further laminitis, I, this is my last slide, just to talk about the different shoeing applications and podiatry and the different mechanics involved the treating laminitis. Um, again, the, the, the slides here on laminitis are just to scare you into trying to identify whether your horse has insulin resistance or Cushing's disease, because if you identify that early, uh, we can be very successful um, making your horses have a long, healthy, um, a good life. So with that, um, I will open it to questions. Um, and I will send this uh, PowerPoint in a PDF format to Karen and she will post it on uh, where she posts things and um, it'll be available and I'm always available for questions. So email, email is not the best, but it works. Um, any questions? I, I have a question from a, a situation that I had a number of years ago in the early nineties where a horse, um, foundered just behind and then later in the episode it it you know and we we tried a whole bunch of things but i my question is is that a surgery that was just described to me at a time not really recommended for this horse is cutting strips out of the wall to relieve the the pressure yeah. and of course uh -huh. it, it, um I used to do that. What is that called? And what are there any, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, there, there used to be a thought where I think that same paper that talked about it was like shoot iodine up the white line. I remember doing that procedure on a horse, um, not right. There used to be horses across the street from city market in Elgebel. And um, the thought process was, you know, to relieve the pressure uh, you know, the abnormal pressure against the lamina. And if you think about it, it wasn't quite right. It didn't have, you know, with a better understanding of the mechanics or the pathology that's involved, you better understand what to involve for um, treatment, right? Um, and what's really at play here is, yeah, there's some uh, unique a trimming mechanism or a, a means to trim a laminitic horse, but more importantly, there's also uh, a different method to elevate the horse's heel to kind of emulate that chronic shifting weight, right? To release the tension of the deep digital flexor tendon and improve the blood flow to foot. So, I mean, it's kind of what I went back to about the different mild, moderate, and severe cases of laminitis. I've had horses that did not have the will to live that were mildly rotated that ended up getting put down and then I've had horses recently that rotated 15 degrees on the x-ray before we saw them and they have the will to live, they lay down when they need to, they take their medications as need be and they have wonderful lives. Um, so I, I look back and say, I've, I've learned from those things but I don't think we do some of those things anymore. Um, I had a horse uh, who passed when he was like 28, but he ended up having the Stewart's clogs. Um, the coffin bone had rotated, mm -hmm. but he was n not diagnosed with laminitis. He had, he had had, before I got him, he had had um, navicular surgery mm -hmm. and a tendon was cut and, and the coffin bone rotated a bit down. Mm -hmm. Um, and they put did the Stewart's clogs. Um, yeah, we know. I mentioned the tenotomy, and there, there's there's an old surgery that used to be done for navicular disease called a street nail procedure, where the tendon was partially cut. That's what this was. Yep. Yep. And then we know a completely separate scenario is you know early on, depending on the case metrics, you know there's sometimes the tension of the of the foot. The tension across the lamina can be reduced if we functionally lengthen or sever the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, we know that sometimes that's beneficial in acute uh, phases of the disease, but yet if it's done late in the disease when the lamina are all gone and have no structural support, I've certainly uh, seen colleagues cut deep digital flexor tendons 
and the foot just comes right through the foot because it's like the deep digital flexor tendon is the only thing holding the horse up and they cut the tendon hoping that it's going to include the blood supply and the horse's coffin bones just go straight down. Um, you know, x-rays are, you know, if, if a laminitis wasn't diagnosed, uh, you know, today's digital radiography makes diagnosing laminitis with or without a venogram fairly, uh, I don't want to say straightforward, but um, it's certainly on the radar. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Chuck. Yes, um, so if um, you have horses that are pre predisposed uh, to um, nutrition, sort of new nutritional um, um, imperfections. Hmm. What comes first? Cushing's, insulin resistance, and then at laminitis, and then finally founder. Is there a I mean, cascading I, effect there? You know, the older horse that's maybe got some general health issues, some periodontal disease, some muscle loss, with maybe some foot changes, I'm gonna think Cushing's disease. The younger horse that's an easy keeper, um, maybe, you know, take the time to do a full exam. I go, okay, well, you're an easy keeper. You've got some stretching at the white line, some CD toe. Um, I talk to you a little further and understand your comments in context about what the farrier has said at his visits. I go, okay, I think you probably have an insulin resistant horse. Um, we know that horses that have Cushing's disease that wind up having um, abnormal insulin metabolism founder pre precipitously more frequently than horses that have either one by themselves. Like I say, there's some comorbidity. If you have both, you're, you're, that's bad. Um, but we don't know how interlinked they are. Um, that's kind of my mindset. That said, I've seen some easy keeper 12 year olds that I say, <clears throat> Uh, I don't think you're cushionoid and I, you know, you don't think, you don't see unless you look. I do a dynamic test. They come back, you know, normal with respect to a challenge test for glucose and they are off the chart with respect to Cushing's disease, you know, and um, it, it, you know, while I think our knowledge base has advanced tremendously in 25 years, I think there's still more we don't know. And it's, it's a huge center of research because colic and laminitis are still the two big takers of older horses. I mean, those two things alone represent a disproportionate number of horses lost prematurely. Okay. I think, I think what we'd like to do, um, and I know that uh, Charlie Henderson is on the line. Are you still with us, Charlie? I am. Hi, I Charlie. Am. Hi, hi. Um, because we have the weight tapes, maybe we could make a card. Uh, we're doing some work uh, at the printers uh, this week. <clears throat> Chuck, maybe we could, um, do you have a card, one single card that we could include when we hand out our weight tapes? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I, you can, I have boxes of things and I have those first aid cards. I have business cards. You can if it helps, you know, anybody, then I'm happy to. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to come and pick them up, Chuck. So it'll okay. be good to put that in the whole package of everything. Yeah, got it. You know what I, I like to do? This is what this will seem silly, right? But I'm a parent of teenagers and, you know, <laughs> you have to sometimes find silly things to make relatively routine things get done. <laughs> so I take a black Sharpie and I, you know, there's probably none of you have it, but I can think a lot of people in the valley. I take a black Sharpie, I weigh the horse, right? And then I take a black Sharpie and I make a little mark there and I write the date. And I say, now, if your horse and your diet and your exercise program are doing what they're supposed to be, this is how many pounds your horse should lose in a 60 day period. You know, quantifies, you know, wow. it's a goal. It's, it's harder to think about losing 200 pounds, but if you think about it in losing 20 pound increments, and that's my little nugget is my pot of gold is make little black marks on the weight tape because it's you know, go in the right direction. Good. Yeah. 
Now to Susan's peanut sauce recipe. Um, I, think <laughs> the height. Um, I think we can all be there in about 20 minutes. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we can't thank you enough. This was just oh. terrific. And um, for um, for our website, if you go to our projects page, it's going to be number one on our projects. Um, it's where you're going to be able to find the PowerPoints or the PDFs. Um, and the recordings. It takes me a few days to get the recordings in order, but I um, want to thank you, Chuck, for uh, helping yeah. us do this. Thank Anytime. you. Yes, yeah, thank thanks you. so much, Chuck. So informative, always. Thank you, Good Lena. To see you all. Very interesting. Thank you, Chuck. Tell me when thank we're gonna guys. Do Bye -bye. Glenda, we didn't even see Glenda, but I know she's here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a camera. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Take care, you guys. We'll see you again soon. Thank Bye. you. Thanks all. Bye-bye. I don't know how to get out. <laughs> I'll get you out.